This morning I'm going to look at the, uh, the Nativity, Advent, but I'm going to give quite a lot of context up front and then draw some applications. If there are any uh, questions about where you know, I get the data, I'm quite happy to provide uh, the sources for the data, the information that I'm uh, about to give. Just remember, whenever scripture reveals anything historical or scientific, it is to be accepted with the rest of scripture as absolutely true. And uh, science and history must keep in step with that. Of course, we are at odds with the world, the world that believes it, through science and through historical inquiry, can determine the truth and put quest uh, questions against scripture, but we don't believe that. So obviously here we have the nativity of the Christ, which follows the genealogy as provided by Matthew. Matthew starts from Abraham, whereas Luke starts from Adam. And the reason for that is simple. Luke is a Gentile. Matthew is a Jew, but there are other reasons, of course. But the genealogy is rooted in history. It's rooted in history. It happened at a place and a time in history. Um, late in the 19th century, there were a couple of theologians, Schleiermacher and Bultmann, in Germany, I am ashamed to say, led the pack questioning the authority of scripture and divided history into two kinds of history. There's some very complex German words describing that and I won't try and repeat them, but there's a real history and they tried to create a kind of a spiritual history. And into that spiritual history, they put the life of Jesus and everything and it wasn't that important to them that it actually happened as long as it made you feel all comfortable and good. And that was, of course, an attempt to discredit the authority of Scripture. But this is rooted in history. So I'm going to start off going through the inter intertestamental period, which actually precedes this. And I found this fascinating. So the first account will be purely historical, and it would be, in a sense, preaching on a blank page in Scripture, which would be that blank page between the Old and New Testament. The intertestamental period is known as the 400 years of silence. Just imagine that. God is silent for 400 years. Silent insofar as he didn't have prophets who spoke his word directly as had, ha had happened up until Malachi. You will recall that in 586 BC, um, I'm not using the new very trendy nomenclature BCE, which is before the common era, no, BC before Christ. 586 BC, Israel was attacked and fell to Babylon, and there was a 20-year reign where many people died, and the temple was destroyed in 539, remember we're working backwards now since it's BC, Babylon fell to the Persians, controlled by King Cyrus. And some Jews then returned and rebuilt the temple, about 50,000 Jews. Remember, there were about 2 million Jews in exile. In the year 515, the rebuilding of the temple is done. And Ezra then comes to teach the law in about 456 BC, and the notion of a synagogue actually starts then. The synagogues you see around here today, the actual notion started then, which are like many places where they can meet. Just mentioning these things by the by. I'll draw on them later, those that are relevant. About 445 BC, with Nehemiah, they rebuild the city as well. And you will record in the book of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah and Ezra are one book in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, they build the walls. The last prophet, Malachi, preaches his message in about 480 B.C. So we've come all the way from 580, 6 B.C. to 480 B.C. And at 480 B.C. the period of silence begins. The prophets stop. 
During the intertestamental period, however, lots will happen. Palestine is conquered by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. He's a Macedonian, so the Greeks take over. Initially, they are glad to have him because they are tired of the Assyrian rule and the problems that had preceded it. But what happens is that a Hellenistic culture descends on Palestine and it is Hellenized, as it were, and it is during this period that, in fact, the Hebrew Bible is translated into Hellenistic Greek. And that is where we get our Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew texts. And those who study this um, will know that the Septuagint is referred to as the LXX. And that's because, according to legend, it was written by 70 scholars in 70 days, LXX referring to the 70. We're not sure that is the case. It's about 250 BC that the Septuagint is in fact created. Then in 167 BC, Syrian overlords control Palestine and one of the most wicked leaders in history, Antiochus Epiphanes, rules, in fact, he turns the temple into a shrine for Zeus, an absolute desecration, certainly for the Jews. This, is, of course, sparks an incredible resistance amongst the Jews. Just in a sense, you can sympathize. They are not hearing from prophets anymore. God has clearly put them under that bondage due to their own wrongdoing. But in addition to that, they see their temple much like today, their temple taken over by another religion. So what they do is they conjure up that national fervor and they, they revolt in a revolt, a revolution called the Maccabean Revolt, led by a man by the name of Judas, also known as the Hammer. And they win. In 164 BC, they retake Jerusalem. Worship is restored. And they light candles to celebrate this. And that, by the way, is where Hanukkah comes from. What they're celebrating right now comes from the victory by, of the Maccabean re revolt. There's, of course, a lot else that happens. But what is important for us is that in 63 BC, a new empire takes over. Now, what's really interesting is if you go back to the book of Daniel, when Daniel speaks to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel predicts all of this through Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And this is, of course, the empire of iron and clay, which is the Roman Empire. You recall Nebuchadnezzar's dream was the golden head and, and the chest and so forth, and all that down to iron legs and the iron and clay feet. Well, that was the fourth empire, having predicted Alexander and the Syrians and all of that. So the new great empire, which would last for about a thousand years, the Roman Empire takes over. Just to put you in context, it's so interesting because the genealogy goes back to Abraham here. In Abraham's time, the average age was 140. In Roman times, the average age people lived to was 25. Lots of mortality, infant mortality, during the Roman Empire. The population of the world was probably around 350 million people of the world, the entire world at that stage. Okay, the Roman Empire. Whereas it was a lot smaller, of course, around the time of Abraham. So it's interesting just to put those things in context, to see how much had changed over all the generations the 14 times three generations from Abraham all the way through to the intertestamental period. But the Romans take Jerusalem in 63 BC under Pompey, the emperor. And in 40 BC, Herod, a quasi Jew, I say quasi Jew because he is really an Edomian, he's descended from Edom, which, by the way, is, was originally Esau. 
He spends no expense, he, he spares no expense, should I say, in rebuilding the temple in 20 BC. A magnificent temple, physically that is. Perhaps equaling to Solomon's temple, we're not sure. And in fact, the construction was carried out by priests and it covers 13 acres and it is finished actually after Christ has already died and risen again. So in AD 62, it is finished. So while Christ was alive, that temple would have been under construction. So that's the background regarding the intertestamental period. I found it interesting. There are some applications we can draw from that, and I will draw on them a little later. Now I want to look at Joseph and Mary in the virgin birth, and that is, of course, the passage we had read to us. It is worthwhile noting that the engagement period, and you see here we come now right to the micro, we're looking at two people, and this is, of course, the advent of Jesus Christ, and this is the coming of the Messiah after 400 years of silence. They have one year's engagement period, and what would normally happen is that engagement in those days was treated far more seriously than it is today, and in fact, if a man left a woman during engagement, he could be sued by the parents. And it is during that time that he is to prepare a house for her, and the house is in fact even inspected by the parents in some cases. So that's the period during which Joseph and Mary are in. And sexual chastity was observed during this period. And it's during this period that Joseph finds out that his wife is pregnant. Or his fiancé, if you like, in our modern nomenclature. This is the only pregnancy of which it can be said that they really, really didn't try. You hear people to say today... <laughs> Um, gee, we, you know, uh, we had a mistake, you know, we weren't even trying. Well, no, they, <laughs> they were. The point is, this one really was without even trying. She fell pregnant. In order to protect her integrity, he decides he would divorce her quietly, which would only have required the presence of at least two elders uh, of the Sanhedrin present to discuss the divorce and then to quietly divorce her to try and keep it quiet. There is, of course, speculation about Mary having been very young. Some have even suggested down to 12 years of age, which is ridiculous, but certainly in her teens. And, of course, this has given rise to some of the critics, and I will now build this in as a theme going forward. Constant critics of Scripture. I've already alluded to it, saying that, in fact, the the, the Hebrew culture engaged in child brides. That's absolute rubbish. There was no such thing as child brides in Hebrew culture. It's just that they did get married young at that, at that point. Child brides is a thing of the Islam culture, not the Jewish culture. It is, of course, critically important to the Christian religion that Mary conceived without ever having had sex. The scriptures are very clear. And according to Isaiah 7.14, which is in fact the passage referenced here, verse 23, see the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will name him Emmanuel. Once again, the very clever critics have suggested that the Hebrew or Masoretic text says young maiden, whereas the Septuagint says virgin. But in fact, the two terms are interchangeable in Hebrew culture. They're synonymous. Once again, it is clear that the Septuagint provided almost a sharper focus for the interpretation of the wording. And it's also worth worth noting that nothing, absolutely nothing, of Joseph's DNA is found in Jesus Christ. The 23 chromosomes that come from the Father did not come from Joseph. As to how exactly those 23 chromosomes were formed, we, we, can, we can only speculate, but we do know that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is one of the greatest mysteries of the virgin birth. It has been suggested that if one wants to fully understand the virgin birth, one might actually lose one's mind. But if one wants to reject the virgin birth, you certainly will lose your soul. I stand under correction, but from what I've heard, it is the male who determines the blood of the child, 
And if this is true, then clearly Christ could not have inherited his father's blood since blood is crucial to the entire notion of atonement. The purity of the blood. But be that as it may, at best Joseph was a foster father or a stepfather. And in fact, he disappears from the annals of history at this point. The speculation is that he died even while Christ was still alive. It is worth noting here that the Catholic notion of the perpetual virginity of Mary is not right. It is unfounded. Since we read here that they resume sexual relations after the birth of Christ, and in fact Christ has the following brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Yes, Christ had a brother named Judas. Not the Judas, of course, we've come to know in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55. So I find it really helpful to seat this firmly within the historical context, which is what I'm trying to do now. It's just put it firmly within historical context as people can relate to it, because this is our religion. Our religion is grounded firmly within history. Uh, it is not, I think, what the Germans call the Wissenschaft or whatever it is, the, 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 the super science or the super history, which is really a spiritual history that didn't really happen, and, or what the Jesus Seminar people, that was another group who tried to actually discredit the life of Christ, suggested was didn't really happen. And you'll find today in the new, with the new atheism, um, the first answer will be, oh, do you, really, you believe he really existed? Because since it's been 2,020 years, people say, well, you know, maybe he didn't really exist. Well, if we have to doubt the life of Jesus, we have to doubt the life, certainly, even more so of Julius Caesar and Alexander, because there are even fewer records of them having existed. The 5,000 manuscripts of Jesus Christ, written within a couple of centuries, some of them written within the living years, the memory, the living memory. So it's worth noting that Joseph probably dies during Jesus' life or even before the beginning of his ministry. There is some apocryphal work on Joseph, but it is not to be trusted. It is known as the history of Joseph the carpenter. It postulates that Joseph died more or less when Jesus was 19 years of age. This is not scriptural. This is purely extra scriptural stuff. It's not corroborated even by the historians of the day, Josephus, Tacitus, um, but it is, and you'll find certainly within the Catholic Church, a lot of that kind of speculation. So the third major contextual thing here is the prophecies of Jesus. And that's important because we see here in verse 23, there's a reference to the prophecy of Jesus. There are 13 remarkable prophecies of the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. There, there are a lot more, but 13 specific ones, and I'll go through a few of them. While critics and scholars who believe themselves to be very clever dispute these, in particular, Jewish scholars, and it could be understood, obviously, because the Jewish scholars uh, don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and uh, interpretations of Messiahship have now ranged from the nation Israel to that. It got, it got very vague and abstract with them. But these prophecies include, for example, Hosea 11.1, 1, Savior called out of Egypt. Jeremiah 31.15, weeping mothers, Herod is slaughtering the children. Isaiah 11.1, 1, the stump of David, which is in fact an ironic use of the term because anything that comes from Nazareth is twisted and those branches, that, that, that stem that grew out of the ground, the tree being referenced is a twisted branch and that twisted stem. So that's, that's the reference. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, taking our diseases. Of course, we see him very soon healing Peter's mother-in-law and so forth. Isaiah 42, preaching to the Gentiles in Lebanon, Sidon, and Tyre. Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Psalm 78, 2, speaking in parables. Zechariah 9, 9, mounted on a donkey. Even also, Zechariah, look upon him who you've pierced. An ancient description of a method of dying that didn't even exist in the time of Zechariah. Crucifixion would only be introduced really with the Roman Empire, although it was borrowed from earlier cultures, but in this area introduced by the Roman Empire. And of course, Zechariah predicting the 30 pieces of silver as well. And then down to the specifics, like Psalm 22:18, his clothing was divided by lots. 
remarkable prophecies. And what's so interesting is that when these prophets pronounced these prophecies, they didn't even know what they were saying. I mean, in, in, in respect of what was going to happen. They, they had a very vague notion, but those prophecies were announced within the context of other things. So, for example, when we see here the virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son, they will name him Emmanuel, I think Isaiah is speaking, to Ahaz. And it's kind of in context of Ahaz's life, but the, the verse is just dropped there. And it points to Christ. But one of the great prophecies I haven't mentioned yet is Deuteronomy 18.15, where God says to the, to the Jews, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, he's speaking through Moses, from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. As far back as the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy. But there is a far deeper level of prophecy predicting Christ. As many of the events and accounts in the Gospels actually echo or mirror events and accounts of the Old Testament. Christ's similarity to Moses, for example. Remarkable parallels. <coughs> and the parallels are, let's consider them. They were born during times where God's people were being oppressed. They were both hidden as babies because their leaders, the leaders of the time wanted them dead. When he was three months old, Moses' mother put him in a basket along the Nile River and was, he was found and adopted by a daughter of the Pharaoh. Jesus is also taken to Egypt to avoid being murdered by Herod Archelaus. Before beginning their ministry, both Moses and Jesus had supernatural moments in which God prepared them to go forth. Moses with a burning bush and Jesus baptized by John the Baptist. Moses spent 40 years in the land of Midian, maturing, 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai, receiving the law and fasting, 40 days and 40 nights, fasting and interceding for the Israelites at other times, and 40 years in the wilderness, waiting for the Israelites to be able to enter the promised land. Jesus spent 40 days and nights fasting in the desert, resisting the temptations of the devil. <coughs> Moses interceded for the Israelites, interceded for the Israelites at Sinai, and Christ interceded for his disciples. Moses parted the Red Sea, and Jesus calmed the Sea of Galilee and even walked on it. Moses offered the water to Jethro's daughters, and Jesus offered water to the Samaritan woman. Moses fed the Israelites through the wilderness with manna and quail, and Jesus fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. These parallels and many others are quite remarkable. Once again, the critics will say they're too remarkable. I oh, know, it's just too much. People sat down and said, like, let's write the gospel and let's, let's write it so it's a parallel of, the, of the, the account of Moses. No, no, there was no time for that. Yes, if they had 500 years to write it, they might have constructed something like that. There was no time for that. Remember, I said, some of these documents are written within living memory. That means people who wrote these documents saw Jesus. Saw him raised from the dead. It's not possible. There wasn't enough knowledge and enough time to create these. And so, finally, after all that, the contextual stuff, let's just look at some of the applications. All this historical and theological data, to use the modern term, there's a reason for it. Christ makes God approachable. John chapter 2, Jesus declares that he is the temple. All the Jews are just looking to this temple under construction and are having these distant memories of Solomon's temple and the times of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and the building of the temple and all of that. And Jesus says, no, no, look here. He's surrounded by Pharisees. But at the end of the story, Jesus says, don't you know that something greater than the temple is here? He's greater than their temple. While being born in a manger, probably in a cave. In a stable, perhaps. The very temple, the presence of God amongst people. Christ the Savior. And yes, it's messy. There's the intertestamental period where things went horribly wrong. 
where they lost everything they had got. And as they come out of that intertestamental period and the Romans are, have got them in a vice grip, this new powerful empire that runs purely on power and is ruthless, it's messy. It is messy. But God is there with them, coming first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. Christ the Savior. John announces him, the last of the Old Testament prophets, by the way, not New Testament. In fact, it isn't Malachi, it is John. Preparing a way for him in the wilderness. God visits humanity in the form of Jesus Christ. Secondly, Christ the mediator. Throughout the Old Testament, we have nothing like this. Throughout the Old Testament, there is this huge gap between people and God. We look at it, we see it in, in Sinai where the people are at the base of the mountain. They can't even look up to the top of that mountain. <coughs> Only Moses can go up there and face God. We see it with Job, where Job struggles under the suffering of, 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 of calamities brought to his, to his life, allowed by God. But Job says in Job chapter 9, he cries, Truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could answer him once in a thousand times, for he is not a man, as I am. That I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any day, daylight between us that might lay, he lay his hand upon us both. He's not a man. That was the great anguish of the Old Testament. And even for those Christians, like Luther, before they became a Christian, Luther always said, but this God is so angry because he misunderstood God. He didn't understand this. He's so angry all the time. And while he was wrong, Ruth Luther was wrong, he did have an understanding of God that is correct in terms of God's holiness and our sinfulness. Christ, the mediator, that's what he is. The Savior has to be a mediator. It's because of God's high standards which have never, ever, ever changed. There's a great gulf fixed between us and God. And we cannot traverse that gulf. It's not a bridgeable gap. You hear Job's desperate words. He's not a man as I am that I should answer him. He's too good. You see, this is one of the strongest arguments that apologists use when they argue with atheists. What about the debt? Debt doesn't go away. Just to use an analogy, after the COVID pandemic, the American nation is now running at $23 trillion. They will never pay that debt back. The whole world can't pay, make enough money to pay that debt back. But that's just a small thing. $23 trillion. But it's nothing compared to the debt we have with God. The debt has to be paid. If there's any hope, if there's any semblance of hope that we can be acceptable before God, that debt must be paid. And that is why we see this child born to a virgin. It can be nothing less. The child cannot be born of normal humans. It cannot be a natural birth. Because the debt has to be paid, and the debt can only be paid by someone who is perfect. And that's why we have this wonderful word that goes back all the way to Isaiah 7.14. Emmanuel, God with us. Not God on top of the mountain. Not God in the burning bush who says, take off your shoes because it's holy ground. God with us. Born in a dirty, 
stable. The eternal God. That's the only way the debt is going to be paid. God coming into the world to sort the problem out properly. He has the capital, if you like, the spiritual capital to sort it out. But it's so much more than that. What better solution than him immersing himself in our problem by taking our debt? We don't have it. It's an enormous debt. And this is, as I say, one of the great apologetic arguments. What do you do about the debt? Some of you, possibly most of you, know what it's like to arrive back home, to find that people have rummaged through your clothes, have taken your, 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 your assets. They broke into your personal space. It was a violation. There are women who know what it is, means to be violated by a man who raped them. What do you think happens after that? There's a debt. It doesn't just go away. There's a massive debt that must be paid. That debt has to be dealt with. One way or the other, the perpetrators of those crimes will pay for their own debt. Or Christ will pay for their debt. It's that simple. Sin is always punished. Sin is never not punished. In this modern gospel that we've had, it's almost as if people are being told that God actually turns a blind eye. He doesn't turn a blind eye. He never turned a blind eye. How does the average non-Christian cope with this debt? How did we cope with this debt before we knew Christ? How do they live from day to day? It's through lies and deception, misdirection. Because the moment the debt starts growing, they look somewhere else to another God. Just to put it aside, it's a, it's, it's a fig leaf, it's pushing it away. But it never goes away. I'm amazed, and I, I'm not going to prize one political party above another. That's not my job, it's not any pastor's job from the pulpit. But he can give advice, but I'm amazed at how happy some people are about a new administration that is going to, number one, accept that babies are killed up until the last day of pregnancy. Number two, marry homosexuals. Number three, allow children of eight years to choose whether they want to be male or female. I'm amazed that people are overjoyed by this. Certainly the last administration was no angelic administration either. A leader who committed adultery and wasn't a good father, we, we're aware of that. Also reprehensible. But how can you be happy? How can you be happy with this? And we're reminded once again of how the Jews descended during this period before now. How they descended into mayhem. That's where we go when the debt gathers. And we don't get better, we get worse. Because if there's no one to fix us, we get worse. That's why the following is so important. The virgin birth. Immaculate conception. A perfect life. A death in our place. Critical. This little passage to speak to us about that. If this didn't happen, we may as well go and enjoy it all. Eat, drink, and be merry, as Paul says. If this didn't happen. That one carol we sing. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. If we don't have that, we have nothing. And so what should you and I do, brothers and sisters? What should you and I do? You know, I'm so tired of hearing, you know, that Jesus has done everything for us. And that, of course, I'm not tired of hearing. But then the, the added uh, thing is, you know, it's all done for you. The law is not that important anymore. It's okay. Don't worry. 
God's standards have not changed. We are to love him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, everything that is in you. Because when he's done this for you, how can you not? How can you not try at least to be holy as he is holy? And yes, we do know that in essence, he looks upon Christ when he sees us and the holiness is assured. That's wonderful. But how can you not strive to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? How can you not try to? I know what it's like. You get down to pray and you come before God and it just feels like nothing is different. It feels like you're just going through the motions. But it's not that. It's not about how you feel. It's loving him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. It's the upside-down religion, you see. It's the one that says the opposite to all the other religions, which say you have to earn your place, either with God or for a new life, which will return when you come back as a cockroach or whatever it is. What, whatever it is, you've always got to earn something. It's been earned for you. So you try harder than anyone else. I watched a series re recently called Wild Wild Country on Netflix. It's about that cult that started up in the USA. It started up in India and it moved to the USA. They had lots of money. These people were fanatical, but it was demonic. What is really shameful is that Christians don't even have a tenth of that zeal. Don't even have a tenth of that zeal. They built an entire city. They worked through the night. It's not commendable because a demonic cult based on sex and all sorts of other things. And yet we are given this and we take it easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Because the virgin became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. And he has been with us. Amen.